Hello, world singers. My name is Brooke. And I'm Tyler. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Welcome back, all of you lovely people. We are going to be covering the Ars Arcanum today. They are quite similar from book to book. In fact, so similar that you may have read the Ars Arcanum in Way of Kings and then thought subsequently that you didn't need to because you'd already read it. However, Secret secrets. Yes. If you actually read all of the Ars Arcanum in every book, there are new gemstones, metaphorically speaking, hidden in each one. And so we are talking about the things specific to the Rhythm of War Ars Arcanum in this episode. Things that maybe if you didn't read it, you missed out on. The way that I see the Ars Arcanum throughout the Cosmere is like the after the credits totally in Marvel. Yes. So huh. you don't have to stay around. And it all starts the same, which is credits. You've seen credits so many times yeah. that you just kind of start zoning out. But then they started to trick you with the Nick Furies and the whatnots and the crossovers. But like, that's what's going on with the Ars Arcanum. Brandon has words. So at the end of all of his words, he gives you more words. And inside of those <laughs> words, he hides secrets. We're going to dive deep into the Ars Arcanum and all the different little tidbits that we can pick out. But want to remind everyone that this is birthday season. Brooke and I's birthday months. The better of the two's birthday is coming up. (laughs) And the best way that you can help spread the Cosmere conversations to other people so that more people can be part of these conversations is to do the rating, do the reviews, do the shares, tell someone about us, be like, you've read all the Cosmere. I love it. Here's a podcast that is just for you, just spoilerific waiting for you. That would make everyone really happy. Not just us, the entire universe would be happy. (laughs) We all need some good vibes out in the universe. I believe this will be one of our last requests, and then we will go dormant for the rest of time until birthday season (laughs) is upon us again. Thank you so much for listening. Let's get to Rhythm of Wars, Ars Arcanum. We're going to start with soul casting, which... I believe is either a new section entirely in the Ars Arcanum, or it is greatly expanded in Rhythm of War versus previous books. Soul casting is obviously one of Yasna's powers, along with teleportation, and shares soul casting with the Lightweavers and Shallan. So, Two main characters using this one, and it's really the first time we've gotten Chris's insights and perspective. And this is like really one of the, I would say, biggest, most important powers on Rashar, which Chris even references in her essay about soul casting, uh, mentioning that this is really the thing that has allowed armies on Rashar Mm -hmm. to wage the long battles that they do because they're able to produce food via soul casting. Which is a great point where we saw on Scandriel one of the big things that Ellen's government was always struggling with. Supply chain. Yes, supply chain and like how it could be easily interrupted by the fast moving coloss and stuff like that. And we also see, of course, on Scandriel that one person, yes, a very powerful person, the Lord Ruler, was able to keep stasis for a thousand years and kind of prevent the growth of these advanced military tactics and large armies that on earth really weren't possible until like 18th, 19th century and on Rashar have become possible because of soul casting. But I think on other planets, they wouldn't be able to do this type of stuff and then therefore wouldn't be like reaping the quote unquote benefits of war (laughs) that is often like technological advancement so you can kill one another and keep each other alive. Like those towns that are basically built around the camps in way of kings that's like a really impressive feat of infrastructure and 
the yeah, power I mean, it completely changes the game when exactly. not only do you not have to worry about providing sustenance, but you also don't have to worry about any kind of shelter, particularly in an environment where there are high storms every yeah. whatever week or so. So that is what we have to say about the importance of soul casting. However, Chris goes on to say, quote, what intrigues me most about soul casting, however, are all the things we can infer about the world and investiture from it. For example, certain gemstones are requisite in producing certain results. If you wish to produce grain, your soul caster must both be attuned to that transformation and have an emerald, not a different gemstone, attached. End quote. And then what I find very interesting about that is the next line where we get into the color theory of all the goings on here. She says, quote, the color is the most important part, not their actual axial makeup, end quote. Because, because most gem, well, many gemstones are structurally identical. So as she is saying, like, there's no difference in the actual atoms or axi axi yeah. that are making up the gemstones the only difference is color so there's something about color that is required to create something specific now along with the rhythm of growing crops that is taught to the humans in this book kind of like the secret that the listener people had for growing their grain and different crops in these difficult environments is about singing to them, basically, like singing to the plants and helping them grow. And that correlation between the music, the sound, the rhythm, and now what we know about color being key to producing something mm -hmm. in the real world. Like the specific wavelength. Yes. You mean, yeah. Exactly. And so I think that that is the tie-in that is really important to see that what is going on with the aided or the magically enhanced crop growing via sound, I think is similar to what is going on with the color in soul casting. Yeah. And just like... It doesn't have to do with, again, like the axial makeup, it has to do with the frequency of the wavelengths emanating from the gemstone. And I believe that it is possibly then connected to the spren, but that is the biggest of speculation, so we'll hold off on for now. Chris also says, quote, Curiously, these gemstones seem tied to the original abilities of the soul casters who were an order of knights radiant, but they don't seem essential to the actual operation of the investiture when performed by a living radiant. End quote. So essentially, she is talking about the fact that, uh, like, Yasna doesn't need a specific gemstone in order to use her radiant powers, right? And Chris goes on to say, quote, I do not know the connection here, though it implies something valuable. Soul casters, the devices, were created to imitate the abilities of the surge of soul casting or transformation. This is yet another mechanical imitation of something once available only to a select few within the bounds of an invested art. The honor blades on Rashar, indeed, may be the very first example of this from thousands of years ago. End quote. And then she connects it back to, as we talk about all of the time, the uh, fabrials that are being created on Scadrial to democratize the powers of Allomancy and Farukmi. So when we talk about kind of the fractal nature of all of these different aspects of how the heralds are a little bit like Vasher, who is a little bit like Thydekar, where Spren blades are kind of a copy of Honor blades and Shard blades are kind of a copy of Spren blades or their well, remnants yeah, of them. yeah, and like Honor blades, like what are Honor blades creating, you know? Because she says that the honor blades are the first example of a mechanical imitation of something available to only a few, you know? So I'm just curious, like, what is the thing that honor blades were patterned on or, like, were trying to bring about? Do you think it's just the surges that were available on Ashen? 
Yes, I definitely think there's the connection to the surges. I believe that the honor blades, the thing that they are mimicking is the spiritual Just like God power? I would say maybe like God power when God wants to have a blade. Like the honor would assumingly be able to create his own weapon at any time if he so saw fit. Yeah, but the honor blades do more than just be a sword, right? They give surge binding to the heralds or to anyone who wields them, really. And they are made up of... Yeah, Tanavastium. Exactly, the metal of Tanavast that is produced on Rashar. So I'm wondering if, like, honor... And the heralds or whatever, before they were heralds, were like, hmm, we have a problem we need to solve. It sure would be great if you guys had the same surge binding, magic wielding powers that you had on Ashen. And then Honor was like, I will make something that will give you those powers back so that you can specifically fight this one fight. But like, didn't want them to have, you know, free reign of their power because of what happened on Ashen. Yes. And so maybe under pressure the honor blades were created to give an advantage Mm -hmm. to the 10 heralds, the 10 select humans. But the downstream effect of that is, of course, more powerful, I think, in the spren bond and the spren blade that can be manifested because of the efficiency of using stormlight that is clear and the versatility of the spren bond being able to summon armor and you know change that and move it and have it be invisible and like the blade be able to zip off and go do some like it's just clearly a better (laughs) weapon yeah if that's the only way we're looking at it i think that it's because it was purposefully limited by honor Mm -hmm. and he was saying like you can have a little bit but i'm going to control it and then Loopholes, loopholes, loopholes. We talk about them all the time, right? Just like little escapes from the bounds that are set on these heralds in kind of the same way that Brandon writes to escape certain situations or like restrictions that he places on because of a magic system or geography or whatnot. I do believe that with the story of Dalinar, Zeth, and Kaladin, we believe going to Mm -hmm. Shinovar to find the source of the honor blades and to you know meet the wielders of these ancient weapons next book is going to be honor blade heavy in my guess we'll see we mentioned how the shin have not done a great job of keeping track of (laughs) the honor blades in this essay on soul casting uh chris also calls out the weirdness that is the base 10 structure on Rashar, which if you listen to past episodes, we did touch on briefly. But just as a reminder, Chris says, quote, on Rashar, there are considered to be 10 elements, not the traditional four or 16, depending on local tradition, end quote. So I'm just coming back to my theory that perhaps there the 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 10 is a misleading Mm -hmm. structure that's been given to us and that there are actually an additional six to make 16 uh surges possibly because i would say the only real connection to the greater world that the 10 elements or the the 10 surges and that 10 structure comes from is the planets. There are 10 planets in the Rosharian system, correct? Yes. There and are 10 gas giants in the oh, outer after, reaches of, of we the system. We have the three inner planets yeah. uh, and then the 10 gas giants. Yeah. And so my thought process is this. The only sources that we have of why is 10 important is historical, religious, and that bit about the gas giants, it's like, you. it's very easy to look around and see like, well, the humans just kind of picked 10, not mm-hmm. there actually were 10. They didn't right. know about all 16 surges. They picked 10 maybe because of the gas giants and then developed their stories around 10. Oh, that's interesting. Like sure. everything is yeah. a story based on that, but it's not based on the actual reality of what exists on Rashar. They've just kind of 
stumbled into it because of the history that Brandon really does play a lot with more in his Skyward series. And I'm not going to spoil anything about that series at all, just for the readers who haven't gone there. But the element of what do we know about our history and how important our history is, is played with there as well. And I think that could be what is happening is that maybe there are 16 surges. Yeah, I kind of like that call to what we see of some ancient cultures like on earth that, you know, when we're looking for answers, we look to the world around us. And if there are 10 super bright stars in the sky, you know, we're going to create stories and answers for ourselves around those things. One other thought that kind of goes in the opposite direction here is I also wonder if those 10 gas giants were created by humans in like a cognitive sort of way. Like, are those gas Mm. giants the physical manifestation of all of the cognitive thoughts that people have, like about the heralds or whatever that, you know, we've talked a lot about how people's current imaginings of the heralds may be influencing them since they still exist. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if like maybe instead of going into the herald, all of those thoughts coalesce into a gas giant that represents like all of the thoughts about Yezrian, all of the thoughts about Nalan. That is a fun theory. And I think that the only way that we could get some confirmation is if there's a difference in the appearance or existence of one now that Yezrian is dead. Oh, Because yeah. like there should be a corresponding well, relationship. No, because I don't think it's actually connected to Yezrian in any real way. You think it's as only long as, the thoughts? Yeah, as long as people are still imagining Yezrian and thinking about him and have some cognitive concept of Yezrian, mm-hmm. then the gas giant exists. That's interesting, and it's always like kind of a chicken or the egg type of yeah. thing. But I do think that... Generally, it would be hard to describe based on other things we know. Why wouldn't the thoughts, emotions, feelings about Yezrian go to the still living and cognitive shadow of Yezrian that is there? Like, why would they bypass him and go to this kind of physical manifestation as a gas giant? It would be like... Well, yeah, I mean, we don't have any proof that people's thoughts about other people change them. You know, like the way that Adolin thinks about Kaladin doesn't change who Kaladin is. Mm, does it? Does it? <laughs> does it? Not in an actual way. Only in, you know, a regular interpersonal way. Yeah. I guess I was listening to a conversation uh, about manifesting, and it sounded very similar to <laughs> what uh, some of the goings on between the cognitive realm and the physical realm and Uh people's thoughts and emotions of just like, yeah, if you are trying to get a new job and you are taking a bunch of steps because you believe that it's possible that you can get a new job, you are manifesting in a way your Mm -hmm. new job. Sure. And if you instead believe, like some people in many parts of the world right now, that it is pointless to try because it's so hard or so difficult or so impossible to imagine, then you do things that don't take you down the path and you kind of manifest your own reality that way. And this question of creating or manifesting, especially in a mechanical imitation way, to me is one of the most unique aspects of soul casting and soul casters because remember in some of the interludes we saw a soul caster and what becomes of a very devout soul caster and like why they're shrouded in mystery and there's this weird aspect of like soul casters eat their users or like overtake their users yeah and it's this strange example i think of a To me, it reminds me of radiation sickness for the people who were first discovering nuclear power Mm -hmm. and bombs and all that stuff. And just like, you know, a Chernobyl-like event, but only for them, like isolated just for them. And they have become like mutated by the use of soul casters. Yeah. So it's a dangerous weapon and there's dangerous powers afoot here. Yeah, I think that's a good point too, as something to remember as we're Again, starting to look at some of these things also being present on other planets. Like if there is this sort of secretive downside to mechanical soul casters, 
then we should also be looking for those downsides to the mechanical imitations on Scadrial. Absolutely. One of the ones that I am most fearful of because of the hints, and this is not a, well, it's kind of a spoiler, but in the most general sense, Brandon has said that his plan right now is for Mistborn Era 3 to be kind of like late 20th century vibes. Yeah. And during the 1980s, there were a bunch of drugs, you know, just drugs everywhere. And my fear is that there will be some kind of alimentic or just some way that they abuse yeah. the powers and maybe become like a weird, unequal society about those who are kind of the victims of the users of all of these technologies and powers. A lot of interesting ways to go. I don't want to speculate too much on that and let's stay focused because that idea of tapping into powers that we don't fully understand is actually more apparent when Chris talks about stone shaping. Yes, this is probably the biggest addition to the Ars Arcanum to date. And there is so much contained in the stone shaping essay from Chris. We'll start with, quote, as I've had further occasion to study the use of investiture on Rashar and the curious manifestation of it known as surge binding, I've found occasion to ruminate further on the nature of intent and connection, end quote. So just a couple of things off the bat. We're going to talk more about intent and connection. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but why is it a curious manifestation? Like investiture... Yeah. Is pretty weird throughout the Cosmere. You got the Sandbenders on Chris's own planet, or the Sandmasters. You have the Alimantic. Yeah, and the, people the who swallow metal. Arts. Yeah, like, and then, of course, a geographically limited yeah. metal source that's kind of like channeling spiritual energy from like one place to another. There's just a whole bunch of weird magic. All, and the, <laughs> there's birds. There's birds who give birds. magic powers. Like, I don't understand why this would be considered that curious. I think, I think that it has something to do with the Spren bond. There was like one other point during this essay when she mentions something about the nature of the Spren bond and how she is just starting to learn about some of the mm -hmm. unique ways that that impacts investiture usage. So I think that that's what she is referring to with that curious manifestation. But... I am very curious about what all of that means and what Chris has learned and seen and thinks. But let's talk about the nature of intent and connection, because in our Navani episode and the discoveries that they make regarding anti-void light and the best thing that I can think of is that we also see intent playing a huge role on Nalthus. And we know that there is elements of intent in all of the different magic systems, or at least we believe that there's an element of intent in all the different magic systems. So I think that, that what is the role of intent? That question is going to be very difficult to answer, but very important to answer going forward. Let's start with just some basics on stone shaping, and then we're going to dive a little bit more deeply into that intent connection question. Just about stone shaping sort of in general, quote, this ability manipulates the surge of cohesion and is in many ways cousin to the axial manipulation known as microkinesis as both grant the ability to manipulate the forces that bind individual axi together, end quote. Okay, we got a big word there. Microkinesis. Microkinesis is going <laughs> to be on the exam, kids. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what this can possibly mean and indicate. The key thing is that Chris knows of another power that we have never heard of before mm -hmm. and have and not seen before. And it manipulates axi. And that there is enough of a similarity between the two that Chris is actually worried. And yeah. she sets that up in this next quote. Fortunately, in my explorations, it appears that stone shaping is far less explosive of a power bounded by the rules that honor placed upon it to protect from the mistakes that happened on Yolen. End quote. Huge information dump right there. Yeah. So 
We know or suspect that microkinesis played a role in the destruction of Yolin, and I do wonder if it also played a role in the shattering of Adenalsium. Yeah, it completely makes sense because if we are saying that at least microkinesis, and we don't even really understand stone shaping, but at least microkinesis was powerful enough to manipulate the axi that hold everything together, then at some point, adenalsium is a thing. Like in the physical realm, in the cognitive realm, in the spiritual realm even, there is some thing that is like gravity and just gaining mass and kind of importance and power. And if you can manipulate that, you can just start separating just one after the other. And I definitely see that as like a base level terrifying power. Of just like, you know, Magneto yeah. could like pull metal out of things. <gasps> but if you can manipulate, you're like the most powerful thing in the universe. You can just like separate everything one by one. That is actually one of the problems with microkinesis, which I read is like one of the main reasons why Brandon has not uh, canonized a lot of aspects of microkinesis yet. It's one of the first magic systems that he designed, um, which is discussed in Dragonsteel Prime. And because it has the potential to just be so overpowered, Brandon is still like thinking about how he wants it to actually work uh, in a canonized way in the Cosmere. To relate it back to other things we've said, I think Brandon hasn't found the unique boundaries yeah. for microkinesis as a power, yeah. but he knows that he wants to do something with weakening and manipulating the bonds between axi. And I would see stone shaping as maybe like a little test, like he gets to develop that in the mm -hmm. Stormlight Archive. Yeah, it's a little bit more uh, defined. We get some more information about stone shaping because Chris mentions that her, quote, best agent is undercover as a stone ward, like gathering information about stone shaping, which I just thought was really interesting. So everyone be on the lookout for Chris's agent within the stone wards. I think that there is a stone ward with Adolin and Shallan's crew, right? As yeah. one of the hangers uh, on. I think so. The woman, right? Yes. I... She doesn't strike me as a Chris agent. I think she's legit. And now we have entered into the Shalon rabbit hole where you think everyone is a secret <laughs> exactly. agent. Exactly. And you're just looking for the spy. Where is the spy? <laughs> Everyone's a spy. Now, our main stone shaper from Rhythm of War is, of course, Venli. And we get to see a lot of the first power uses by a stone ward from her perspective. She is, of course, unique because she also has a little void spren in her gem heart. But her and the fused who could do some stone walking oh, yeah. both gave us an insight into the practical uses of a stone ward. To come back to the nature of intent, specifically in stone shaping, because I think this is where we get some uh, very clear examples of this. Um, Chris says specifically that with stone shaping, the intent is very relevant. Quote, the stone senses the desire of the stone ward, and the practitioner is able to shape it through desire as much as through physical force. End quote. Now, this is such an interesting concept where you would believe that strength, like lifting up stone, is going to just be <laughs> the stronger you are, the more stone you can move. But instead, playing with this role of intent and desire is yeah. so interesting. Yeah, it sounds just so much like Awakening, where the stone ward is really having to imagine what they want the stone to do in order for it to happen. You know, it's not like a mechanical type thing where you're just like, oh, move your figures in this shape and then the stone will do this. And I believe has a lot of similarities as well to soul stamping that we see oh, from Shy interesting. in the way that there is, and soul casting for the sure, same reasons. Like a kind of persuasive yeah, element. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where at least there has to be a recognition 
between the stone and the stone ward of like something's going to happen here that we are not necessarily familiar with. This isn't what you do on your day to day, <laughs> but I have so much desire and this, you know, stormlight yeah. and that is going to happen right now. And you are going to, you know, play this role in the production that I am putting on type of thing. It definitely seems like that type of negotiation. And this is where we get that other quote about uh, the nature of the spren bond from Chris. She says, quote, I don't believe I properly understood the way investiture responds to the conscious intent of the user until I read of the interactions of spren and sapient beings on Rashar, end quote. So there's something about spren. I mean, I guess this would apply to just regular like emotion spren or you know what they call mindless spren as well who respond to feelings of humans but then there's also something i think about again the intent as she said of the surge binder that like affects their bonded spren i guess in some way and like maybe that is what creates the power that is then able to be used this really does start to break my brain a little bit <laughs> because if we jump over to chris's planet taldane and you have the white sand that is only white or is only invested when it has been coated mm -hmm. with a bacteria that is able to infuse investiture from the sun yeah and then a sand master, maybe knowing that relationship, maybe not fully understanding that relationship. I don't never got the idea of like how much they were cognizant of what had happened or if they were just manipulating it. Yeah, it seems like they're just manipulating it. But you could kind of see it like, you know, the sand is a gemstone that, well, not the sand, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. The sand and the bacteria are like a gemstone that absorbs investiture from the environment that's mm -hmm. readily available. And then the sand masters are able to use that investiture in some way. And they do use some kind of intent or command, right? Like it seems like they sort of imagine what they want the sand to do and the yes. strength of their intent or command is what allows them to control multiple ribbons of sand as they call it and yes. and do different things with it and the whole story of kenton is that he can't produce as many ribbons right so he has to be more versatile with his one ribbon that he's able to make and does like cool tricks with it and stuff yeah and i think that that's definitely an intent. His whole kind of character arc is about, you know, believing in himself, basically. But I also am just curious if, like you said that the bacteria were kind of like a gemstone. And I'm wondering how close are they to a spren, an unintelligent spren, but like oh, they are like the an emotion spren? Yeah, in the mm. way that they are the center force in allowing the transfer of investiture to these users. Yeah, I mean, that's like the sticking point, right? Is then if these things are sort of parallel, what role is the spren playing really in the channeling of investiture? I don't know. Yeah, I believe <laughs> there's some type of like feedback loop. Basically what I'm wondering is if spren make something like the investiture use we see on Taldane more efficient and better and like they are enhancing something oh, they facilitate they're like better. a catalyst or yes, something exactly. for the reaction that's taking place yes and like the white sand as we just described it is the poor man's version <laughs> of the spren bond and there's definitely something there sure reach out let us know what you think on the twitter reddit facebook anywhere you can join us on patreon become a patron oh it's the best uh, we have double the episodes double the speculations i really do want to talk about not just intent but the willingness that chris mentions as yeah. well yeah this is one of the key points that she mentions in terms of stone shaping and essentially in this essay she says that even though 
stone is one of the most difficult materials to work with in soul casting. The stone is uniformly willing to, quote, obey the commands of a surge binder attuned to cohesion, end quote. So like Yasna is going to have a difficult, a more difficult time turning stone into something else. It's a more immutable material. However, if your surge binder is attuned to cohesion, like a stone ward, stone is apparently just any stone and all stone is like, I'll do whatever you want. I'm real down me. for this. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was very interesting. And she even sort of calls out this weirdness and says, quote, why is stone so eager to change for a stone ward or will shaper? What about it makes it so likely to respond to their desires, to incorporate them, and to enjoy the result? Like a willing audience at a comedy, the stone lets the surge binder guide it. End quote. I love that concept of just a willing audience. Yeah. Like there's a reason that if you go to a comedy show, they mandate that you buy two drinks <laughs> because like that is just making you a tiny bit more willing to the <laughs> silliness that is about to happen. And so too, it seems to be for maybe, maybe the spren is the key there. Maybe that's like what we were talking before about a facilitator or hmm. like they are impressed by that specific spren. It's their favorite comedian uh, <laughs> or, you know, group of comedians, I guess. That's funny. Yeah, I do think, and I think it's interesting that Chris says the stone enjoys the result. Like yeah, she gives it this happy with it. emotion, which is interesting. And it does remind me of, a few points where shard plate is described as feeling like content or something mm. and like happy in its form. I don't know if those two things are related. It just kind of reminded me of the same verbiage. I think that could be a really good call out. When we see a fully fledged stone ward, because we have not yet we just we yeah. know they're there. We know there's a couple stone words, but we haven't gotten. Venley's like accidentally stumbled into stone shaping a couple times. Yeah, as a will shaper, right? Yeah, and we know that the only other thing that I want to call out because I think this is going to be important to our next bit about connection was Dalinar's move that he did uh -huh. in Oathbringer. Yeah, putting the stones back together on the temple. Exactly, and. Fixing that yeah. was a matter that has to be different than stone wards or will shapers, right? Yeah. Because let's look at this from a has... kind of breakdown of their powers. Yeah. Because Dalinar has a crossover power or surge tension with stone wards. Mm -hmm. They share those things. Mm -hmm. And Dalinar was able to repair stone but I don't think that he is necessarily limited to stone. Like, I think that was kind of a misdirect yeah. in some ways. Yeah. And yeah, that would what Chris is saying here would not apply to Dalinar because she's specifically saying surge binder attuned to cohesion. cohesion exactly. Yeah. So, not tension, not adhesion, which are the surges that bondsmiths have. But it seems like he can sort of imitate-ish yes. some of those powers by using spiritual adhesion or connection? I think he uses spiritual adhesion to form a connection with an inanimate object and then uses tension somehow to repair that object. But I like I think he could only repair. Like he can't do anything else with he it. He can't shape it. Where in any way. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, stone it. shapers are able to manipulate Change it much it. more yeah, yeah freely and i think that that is really the key difference that i want to call out between like it seemed like dalinar's power was related to stone yeah. shaping mm -hmm. and i think it was actually something else yeah similar obviously because of the crossovers but unique in an element and not like cohesion yes because chris has a couple of important things to say about connection and we want to kind of remind ourselves that that is down our specialty as the yeah. bondsmith. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. his big thing. Quote, the stone can sense the intent of the surge binder and even their past, 
end quote. And she goes on to say that basically stone has a memory and that in stone shaping, the stone can display events that happened in the ancient past and even people that have been long dead, as we see when Venli accidentally stone shapes. It, you know, the stone makes these models sort of of the world and actual people who existed thousands of years ago. The stone is able to display those things. And then it dives into something that I think is really, really interesting. Yes. Because it, she says, quote, there is a divining property to stone shaping, end quote. Yes. I needed to specifically look up what divining means. I had sort of a vague idea of like, uh, tells the future. And you kind think of, of it being related to like, oh, the divine, or is that like what they say about kings? Like kings are divine or blah, blah, blah. No, not at all. I think yeah, we this should word go... divining is coming from divination, mm -hmm. which if you've read Harry Potter, there you, you know, they go to divination class in which they are trying to like scry into the future. And that is part of what divination can be. But divination is the practice of determining the hidden significance or cause of events, sometimes foretelling the future. In ancient Roman culture, divination was concerned with determining the will of the gods. So it was like, it's this practice of searching out meaning, really. And the like it says, the cause of events, which I think is very interesting. So not just looking into the future, but on the case of Rashar, I think being able to look into the past of course. and determine the cause of events, like... That's important. I would like that. Yes, please. And I think the big important question that we should maybe ask ourselves is, is this surge a little bit more of cultivation or honor? Ooh, and I great think question. the answer is definitely cultivation. Yeah, I would say cultivation too, in particular, because when Venli finally does say her ideal female at the end voice. of the book, it's a female voice that accepts. I think that this is really key. Like maybe we have talked before how we think that Lyft and the powers that she has are definitely heavily of cultivation. Yeah. But I believe that cohesion at minimum and maybe tension, but definitely cohesion is a surge that is most of cultivation. And then you connect it to divination, being able to understand the past mm -hmm. and using that knowledge to predict the future. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, bingo, bango, bongo, Taravangian. Oh. Taravangian yeah. uh -huh. did not Just have access idea to future of sight. like broadening of perspective yeah what if she gave Teravangian like all the knowledge of the stones like that would be cool that's what he was oh experiencing gosh. on his one great day <laughs> and it was you know transmuting itself into Teravangian, and so he was just like seeing everything that the stones had ever seen and from that he was able to make the mm -hmm. predictions about the future because it's not future sight mm. it's different it's some other aspect interesting thought interesting thought and that's my craziest theory for this episode yeah i know y'all were it. waiting we had yeah. to get a whole 45 <laughs> minutes in but there it is that's the big one i got for us today the last uh, key point that Chris gives in terms of stone shaping is command, the aspect of command. And she calls out that stone shapers often need to use either a verbal or a mental command in order to control the stone. So kind of connected to intent, but not just the intention, the actual like forming of a specific command with that intent. Um, she mentions this is not unusual in the Cosmere. Obviously, the most similar similar thing is awakening. And then at the very end of this F essay on stone shaping, there is this kind of off topic like tag at the very end that's just buried inside of this stone shaping essay. And she starts talking about anti-investiture and its potential future on the Cosmere and brings up a bunch of little Easter eggs. Let's start with, quote, I find electrifying the news from 
Erythiru that Navani seems to have been able to command the creation of an anti-investiture. Long theorized, this will be my first true evidence it is possible and can only be created through intent. End quote. First instance of anti-investiture, or at least the first one that Chris knows of, which is very interesting. I think that this is like something completely novel. And it has been theorized for a long time by maybe the different Silverlight scholars, Chris herself. It's like big red flags have now gone off. (laughs) The fireworks are shooting, the flares are all around this. And then we get this next line. Quote, I think that perhaps foil deep within his ocean would find this information supports my theories over his. And he'd do well to listen to me on this matter if he ever wishes to achieve control over the ethers as he has insisted is his goal, end quote. Holy moly. That's a shard call out, right? We think foil may be a shard? We do not know. It's also speculated that maybe he is a dragon. We don't really know who foil is, but big question mark there. Apparently he is deep within an ocean. I do want to just call out that it is capitalized. So this is a name and or title of foil. Oh, yeah, I think it's a name. And I guess the title aspect would be if it's a shard, right? Honor is a title. What shard would foil be? I have no idea, but we need a couple other shards to fill out the 16. I don't think this is a shard, but I appreciate your theories. I just want to be clear that I am not thinking that this is a thin sheet of aluminum foil. (laughs) I am saying that it could be, here's the definition of foil, quote, to prevent from attaining an end or to bring to naught. End quote. So I'm saying that if we have all of these shards, some that are about like growth, but others that are kind of about more destruction or ruin. And so like foil could be another example of one of those seemingly in negative shard powers. I don't buy this. In particular, just the way that Chris speaks about this person and the fact that he is trying to achieve control over the ethers, which is like another system of investiture. That seems like much more of a mortal thing than a shard. I can't imagine a shard like arguing with Chris and trying to get control over some system of investiture. What has me confused is also deep within oceans. There's not many things that can live deep within oceans. I think that's why people are wondering if it's a dragon. A dragon, or what about the dragon of the sea, the giant squid? Oh my gosh. (laughs) If we can have dragons, we can have giant magical squid. Sure. I think that's more likely than shard. (laughs) You think that a giant magical squid is more likely than a shard? 100%, yes. Okay, we're going to have to throw this one to the fans. (laughs) Clearly, this is a serious disagreement. Very serious. I want you to hit us back. Do you think that foil is most likely, or at least more likely, a shard or a giant magical squid? Let us know your feedback on the Twitters and all those other things. And apparently Navani's studies and production of anti-investiture supports Chris's theories, which is interesting. Like, what are Chris's theories that have to do with this? And then I was going to insert some uh, additional information about the ethers here, but there is actually quite quite a bit of information about it. So we might do that as its own separate, either regular podcast or maybe a bonus episode for the patrons. Super special patrons get the bonus episodes. You can join now. It's great. <laughs> as is always the case. It has been a pleasure having these conversations with you. Thank you, the fans, for being here. Can't wait to hear what all of you listeners have to say about these very interesting Ars Arcanum essays. I'm sure people have some great thoughts and ideas out there. So send us your feedback. Send us your thought. Send us a review or a star (laughs) on your rating system for Brooke's birthday. Answer some questions that we have thrown out in this podcast because the Ars Arcanum really is about kind of setting up the what's next, what's possible, where are things going. And I think my takeaway from this is that cohesion, tension, and spiritual connection in general, all very important. And the role of intent in the Cosmere Mm -hmm. is like 
more and more defining itself. Yeah, intent and command. We also actually have a Stormlight Archive explained badly today. Sorry, this is uh, such a sporadic segment of the pod. But today we have a great one from Jonas R. You want to read this? Quote, some kids who call themselves princes drink colorful juices they call wine, fight with huge sticks, swords, and hunt down crabs. Some others try to join the game in the sandbox but are not allowed, so they get breathing problems out of sadness and try to compensate for it by collecting and eating grains of sand, gems. Also around, a bald kid in white pajamas and an adult who is declared mad because he is the only one talking sense. End quote. A bald kid in white pajamas. <laughs> it's so good. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Brooke, can you take us away? Until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. 